it's official. We are opening our resistance protest chat, and I could not be happier to have Helio here to cut the metaphorical ribbon with me. For those who don't know, Helio is TikTok's resident expert on anything from the fun hat by Theseus and his Minotaur to the nasty imperialist hangover that we're still trying to shake after 400 plus years of European colonialism. Helio worked in archaeology, in museums across London, and in financial crime compliance. Make of that what you will. And for those who got really lost and don't know who or what brought them here, I'm Abby. I'm writing a PhD on protest and policy making under authoritarianism, which shockingly doesn't include studying countries like the UK, which have never and could never engage in authoritarianism. Never. No, no. So today we're going to be talking about occupied territory, which is the first short story in Resist, written by Badisha. We're also going to be dipping into the historical commentary written by Professor, Professor Richard Hingley from the University of Durham. And it's, it's been emotional. How are you it's doing? an emotional story. I mean, it took me places, I have to say. Like, I, I was stuck in places because I was, I was torn between kind of like approving of the violence and approving of this kind of like horror but at the same time mm. being like i hate this this gives me anxiety i was just yeah lost in the middle somewhere it was a bit like that as well especially because there's um i think i told you like my parents went through the civil war in angola and the war of independence and a lot of the stories that were being told there had parallels that were very very close to home uh issues of violence against women issues of what it means to be colonized and what it means to be native and how the two are pitted against each other. So when I was reading that, I like there were moments in which I was sitting down with my family in a sitting room, listening to old stories that were kind of told as fairy tales for kids. But if you look at the, you know, like at the base of them, they were all stories of colonial violence and of war and exploitation and stuff. So that's what I found uh, made it super appealing to me because this was obviously written for a per from a person and from a perspective that was non-heroic. <laughs> it, it's a heroic story, but told in a non-heroic way from a person who actually went through it or who knows enough of the concept of being colonized or taken or suppressed in some way, who wrote about a reality that we don't have. That, that like you said, is a very... Uh, is, is very common in the imagination of the UK and of Britain as a whole, uh, but that has very little to do with the current British experience when it comes to colonialism and domination. And I find it absolutely fascinating that this is a culture, and this the, the, the short story really brought this to me. This is a culture that, at the same time, praises Boudicca to high heavens. I mean, we have a statue of her next to the House of Commons but completely portrays itself like a, the Roman Empire. You've got this image of Boudicca, who's hugely, like, hugely popular, an image of resistance and freedom for the right wing, especially. And those same people who are describing Boudicca as this, this image of resistance, this symbol of resistance, are the ones who are like crying because people are attacking Churchill for his colonial crimes. You know, the exact mm. same writers, the exact same newspapers who are you know, so nationalist about Boudicca as a figure of the British resistance to, to occupation won't accept the same criticism from subjects of British colonialism. It's just, it blows my mind. It has to do with one of the projections that we do in the past, especially that I see people on the right wing doing, which is the, project of, the projection of whiteness to the, classic, to the classical antiquity past. There was no concept of whiteness and there was a lot of migration in that period. And... They, but they identify, they identify, you know, they identify Romans as white. And you see that, for instance, when you go to the Foreign Office and you see all of those paintings of Britannia wearing a Roman armor and being guilty white and, you know, receiving the tributes and so on and so forth. So you, you have all of that. But at the same time, they also want to claim um, the um, noble savagery within inverted commas of the Celts as you know, like a part of their heritage as well, because they also codify them as, as white. We're speaking about the British Empire and the Roman Empire and the similarities and the distinctions between them. 
And one of the things that I always find fascinating is that no one is no one is willing to accept that the concept of white supremacy is behind colonial expansion, and that makes a complete, like a gigantic difference between the British Empire and the Roman Empire, because you didn't have a, a racial motivation for the expansion of the Roman Empire. You might have uh, military interests. You might have. Uh, when it case in the case of the war that they had with Carthage, you can you can you can have cultural differences, but race wasn't a motive or an excuse to invade another country. Whereas in Europe, throughout the period of colonization and expansion, it was it was weird because it's like a condition for colonialism and without which it couldn't happen. The concept of race just makes not just the concept of race, the concept of race and the concept of scale. I mean, the Romans were able to control the Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean for, I don't know, about 400, 500 years, give or take, with lots of changes and so on and so forth. But the scale of the global reach of Western colonialism is just incredible. Can you tie that in with capitalism as well, though? Like this industrial scale capitalism? Sort of like... The Roman Empire, but on capitalist steroids kind of thing. Yeah, because the Roman Empire, although it had a structure of production that fulfilled the necessities that people had at the time, it didn't use it as an excuse in the same way that the British Empire, for instance, used it. Used it. And when I was reading uh, uh, about the Opium Wars from writers that were from more of a rightward, uh, you know, like bent, what they were saying is that the British Empire was just a trading empire. Like it was just a trading empire. They were offering goods and people wanted their goods and then they established their dominance in that way. It's like so you need the they, emergence they, of, of the company as an actor in international diplomacy, as an actor in international acts of war and aggression, suddenly you have companies going in with the resources, the political power, and kind of the mandate, like if you look at it in a sort of privateering on a much bigger scale kind of, uh, Hmm. you've got these companies going in and breaking open entire countries, entire civilizations in the name of British free trade. Like, it, where's the Roman equivalent of that? That's what I'm sort of looking for. Like, there's obviously trade routes are a huge, and infrastructure is a huge part of our imagining of the Roman Empire, but where's this sort of lead by companies kind of thing? Because that's where we're sort of dancing with fascism with, with the British Empire, because you've got this idea that a company has a mandate to rep- represent sort of national interest and to push forward the needs of the country. And that's super anti-democratic. And when you're looking at, you know, Hong Kong is up until 1997, when we're mm-hmm. talking sort of opium wars and the hangovers. When we're looking at how late this kind of um, very real empire was, you're talking democratic Britain at the time. The definitions of colonialism and definitions of imperialism. And modern, one of the definitions that I read about modern imperialism is that it doesn't need land domination to be able to function. You can dominate a whole area of the world just by the sheer grip that you have on their economy. So, which is something that Romans had protectorates, but their conquests were usually physical. They, there were certain groups of chieftains either men or women, that just seamlessly adjusted to the Roman Empire because the Romans understood that they were a small city that had a large reach and that needed to have other people that would be charmed by their way of life. And it's really interesting when the girl ends up invading the city and she sees um, like the luxury in which these people live. Textbook cooptation. It's like you can either repress people, like in the protest context, you can repress people or you can co-opt them to your cause. And co-optation is so easy when you've got material reward. And authoritarian leaders do this the world over. Even today, like you have performance legitimacy, which is where if you can bring about economic growth and you can Mm. qualitatively improve people's lives in a visible way or improve enough people's lives in a visible way, normally you're just co-opting sort of like elite leaders and Mm -hmm. yeah power structures that are already existing and if you can manage that then you're in basically you don't have to worry about anyone's rights below that or you don't have to worry about rights as a general 
abstract idea because you've you've provided a material benefit. My my immediate thought in this in this um, part of the story that you're talking about is like shit. That's exactly what we do within ourselves. Like people who are slightly better off or have managed to sort of code switch in a more successful way and managed to sort of slip between into sort of class ambiguity. Like we attack each other horribly for that. Like as soon as you show mm -hmm. sort of like a hint or a whiff of middle classness, which I still don't really believe that the middle class exists, but you show sort of a hint of that and suddenly it's like, you're one of them, you know? You're yeah. Tory adjacent kind of thing or, you know, elite adjacent. And that division is so useful because we can't do anything. We can't move forward from it. We're just going to keep massacring each other in the case yeah. of, you know. Like, because my family is mixed race in Angola, when the war broke out, you had black people who had been oppressed on one side and you had white people who were the oppressors. So mixed race people were, on the one hand, <laughs> not white enough. And on the other hand, not black enough. So... Like, these were the people who tangentially benefited from proximity to whiteness, mm -hmm. but weren't white enough to be saved primarily. Do you think people struggle Not with except... that sort of, that, those multiple layers of sort of being part of the sort of oppressive side of the equation while also being under several different intersecting um, elements of oppression at the same time? Do you think people struggle to see that in other people because that's what i got from this story is the idea that um when you're in a situation of such sheer desperation that you rise up and that violence is the answer that suddenly yeah. seeing those sort of intersecting identity markers these sort of you're oppressed and oppressor at the same time suddenly that becomes really much more difficult to do because you're already in that state of i don't have a choice anymore removing responsibility but also kind of removing the ability to see people as people kind of thing like i see it in society today a little bit when you've got people who are striking because of very obvious um lack of access to resources lack of a fair wage for the work that they do not being able to pay for just the normal cost of living you see people who are in this situation and they turn on anyone that they see of having any kind of identifier of not struggle that's financial i did empty speech was that it was a profoundly misguided speech in which he identified two targets, which is liberal elites and minorities, which he basically threw to the walls. And for people who are desperate, I mean, look at me, look at where I live. Like, am I not a soft target? Because, you know, like, am I not receiving a lot of attention? Will people ever look at me and think that I'm going to go out into the streets and I specifically put on, like, markers of privilege on myself because I don't want to be stopped by the police when I say that I go to travel or that I go to the opera or that I go to... Well, they won't, and I don't blame them. But it's just this idea of people trying to fight against violence and identity against an oppressive power. How... It never ceases to surprise me how that is amazing for the past is a, a marker of heroism. But nowadays, the same people that incite this, this sort of situation are the first to judge people who are trying to attain liberation through means of violence. And again, I'm not pro-violence. God, my family went into a, through a civil war. Horrible stories to tell. You see this with, with the protest as well. Like, I... There's, I thought this the whole way through this book, pretty much like you, it's quite easy to categorize sort of an uprising against a colonial power as kind of an act of resistance, but also like there's an element of this, which is just, it's protest. This is an act of political protest, right? You're rising up against an occupying regime. You're rising up against the status quo, the power, and you're trying to sort of change things around. And I, I see so much of the reflection in this, not only in sort of anti-colonial liberation movements in hmm. you know, former colonized countries. Uh, but also when you see it at home as well, you've got people who are rising up since, you know, the Windrush generation, you've got people rising up and mm. saying, no, this is absolutely not acceptable. And you see kind of the characterization in that where people kind of, people, the media, you know, sort of talking about this mm. in a context, you see people drawing a line between peaceful protests which is generally a shorthand for white, for middle class, for 
perhaps somewhat intellectual kind of protest. Yeah. You see climate change falls into this a lot. You don't see many sort of indigenous protests about climate yeah. change. It's always then a riot or an uprising. And there's a sort of intention that peaceful protests are suddenly legitimate kind of protests and the only kind of protests where you have rights that should be protected. And if yeah. you riot or if you're someone who is classified as rioting instead of protesting, like if, you've, if you're frustrated enough that you show emotion during a protest or that you really, that you're in such a dire situation, which so many people are, especially people striking, especially, I don't know if you were mm. in, in 2011 when um, the riots across London happened. Oh, it yes. Characterized as riots, even though it was people being pushed to the absolute limits and expressing that in quite a logical way, really, if you think attacking capitalism, attacking the the symbols of excess, the symbols of, sort of consumerism that you're not allowed access to. It makes all of the sense as an act of political protest. But if you riot, it's no longer a protest. It's like, you're a criminal. And then I think about Boudicca and I'm like, even those on the right hold her up as a symbol of freedom of justice. And yet her rebellion was like a riot on steroids kind of thing. So like, I, I struggle a little, and you know what my PhD is about. So you know that this yeah. is something that like lives rent free in my house, in my house, in my head. <laughs> Also in my house, <laughs> it influences my marriage, seriously. It's a whole thing. Um, but I'm like, how do we define an act of protest? Like this book is full of like examples of sort of collective action. That's, you know, the technical term for protest. And you've got mm. like everything from, from I'm ranting, I can feel it, but I'm, I'm on a roll here. <laughs> you've got everything from like these bloody uprisings to strikes to like, I mean, we've got a one woman protest for, for custody rights, which... Mm hit me so hard like I was weeping for days it was awful and then you've got like drag races across South Wales like you've got so many different types of protest and it's like well what is this you know like the kind of protest that we have in our head is this this middle class white marching through huh yeah huh, huh, wait yeah <laughs> you get to do my thing now yes <laughs> no, wait, wait. okay there's a the camera Jazz, Did you see the... this is for you this is, this, yeah. this is a protest in case it wasn't clear this read did you see did you see the guy who was um stopped by the police because he had a sign saying i have a sign and a policeman went to him and said you couldn't be here you can't be here and he was like why i think the regulation of protest is just a demonstration of power because you can't protest in the right way because you know you have black lives matter and they are considered savages and they riot and they are because they are they do not belong to that paradigm of white middle class blah 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 who go to the process however you have i'm not speaking even about the extinction rebellions i'm speaking about the protests that happened post brexit the pro eu protests and all of these people are being were being derided to a one. Waitrose consuming middle classes who were unattached. So basically, there is no right to protest. There's no right to no, no right mm -hmm. way to protest. Because as you say many times, protest is a challenge to power. It's a flexing of a muscle of people who are who do not have executive power and who do not have legislative power. And that scares people. At this moment, we have a system that is closing. To Ella Braverman, who said, who wrote in an opinion uh, that basically British rights had been contaminated by European rights. And now, and like British legislation has been contaminated by European legislation. And we need to go back to a time in which you are not born with rights. Rights are a gift of parliament to you. And this is the person who is in front of our home office. Like the people who are at this moment in power, I believe firmly because I was educated to be one of those people, are people who believe that they are better than people who aren't like them, because they believe in the they believe in the the merit of the success that they had. They're profoundly individualistic, and they think that you can battle problems if you have willpower enough. Like in their own way they're trying to make the world better because they think that if you have enough hardships, you're going to be able to succeed because if they were able to succeed, you should be able to succeed. Another thing that really frustrates me about, like we were talking about earlier, like this um, thing with the, with the strikes and with the unions and how we have this very sort of monolithic idea of what 
a working class person is supposed to look like. It's kind of the flip side of this dynamic we're just talking about now in the cabinet, where you've got yeah. this, this image of what working classness is, which is male, absolutely male. It is industrial, so it's it's manual jobs. It's not working class as in being a waitress or being in hospitality, which is often a much more insecure form of, of employment than working on an actual factory floor. And it's it's overwhelmingly white. Like this is the idea of what working classness is. And the idea yeah. that you can't have a working class person from the global majority seems so counterintuitive because these are people who are facing, in, if you're just looking at base income, if you're just looking at, at class as something that's income based, which is problematic in its own right, you're looking mm -hmm. at people who are on disproportionately lower incomes for the work that they're doing. The idea that sort of ethnicity trumps class or that, you know, um, even national background trumps class is just, I don't know, I find it really difficult to pin that to even my own lived reality, just mine as an individual. I don't understand how these people are able to remain so blinkered that they can put people into these categories without thinking that doesn't fit with what I've seen of the world. Like how little must they have seen of the world to think that these categories are so distinct and so real. It's not for nothing that extreme polit political movements happen in the times or have, have happened in the 20th century in times of strife, in times in which we are uh, politically insecure, in which the financial situation has been, you know, like has been, um, unbalanced in some way, in which people try to find a group to be able to associate themselves with. And I think part of it is that, and part of it is also the fact that, especially white working classes in the UK and in the world, need to start thinking of themselves not only as the victims of a system that oppresses them, which is correct, but also as the benefiters of the system that oppresses other people. In the UK, you have a, a very, a, an amazing history of syndical movements that, have, that are very rooted in history, but completely, that, that blindly do not acknowledge, either for lack of knowledge or for lack of willpower, that the hardships that they suffered here were a step above potentially, of the hardships that were imposed on other people for them to be able to have the industrial, uh, the, the raw materials to be able to transform mm -hmm. and to be able to take a salary. Upgrade industry. Yeah. Exactly. No one is saying that the, 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 the workers in Man Manchester weren't oppressed. They were. Kids were working all hours of the day. People got made, pe maimed. People were paid pitiful wages. It was absolutely horrifying. However, the product of that helped build roads and schools and cities and develop, you know, like systems transportation. And people were being paid salaries that led to accumulated wealth later on down in generations. They it think led to that workers' they're... rights, like the strikes in Manchester, the strikes in the UK, which, okay, were put down and they were repressed. Of course they were. But yeah. these led to rights that were not afforded to other workers in other parts of the empire. I did a little bit of research on Bidisha Murata, of course, because yeah. I mean, oh, she, yeah. she has caused this. It's her fault that we've been like <laughs> throwing around in these emotional, intellectual circles for the last couple of weeks, or in my case, last couple of weeks. But mm. um, I, I really feel like the reason, like you and me, are both having these same kind of like I've written down in my notes. Like I love how complicated and messy and hard to kind of pin down this story is, and it makes sense. I mean, because she worked in prisons, detention centers, refugee centers in the UK. She's worked for human rights organizations. She's borne witness, obviously, to modern colonialism and its impacts today. So literal impacts in the physical world that we're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she herself exists as a colonial subject because her parents migrated here from India. I think she's Bengali originally. Um, mm -hmm. And this, this sense, I think, what was the quote in the book? I'll have to find it, where it's like, um, everything that's yours is ours and all that's ours is ours forever. Just, mm. it, it sat me, I sat there for a good half hour where I was like, and it goes on and on and on because she's now growing up in this cycle of relative privilege. I mean, she went to Oxford, she went to private school, she's benefited from like the access and the influence that that brings. 
but then she's also got this sort of not juxtaposition I don't think it's it's so stark as that but this messy kind of sticky relationship with the colonizer because she's benefiting from all of that she's benefiting from the education system here she's benefiting from all of the riches that came through this exploitative exactly. with colonization and you see this 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 scene on the banks of the Thames I think it was where it's like the druid um the witch and she's yeah. like you're replacing one sickness with another and I know that I know that we're supposed to and that we, we do separate Roman colonialism from British colonialism. But I mean, this is written by simultaneously a kind of citizen of the colony or of the colonizer, while also still being a colonized subject in itself. So it's obvious mm. that, that that relationship is going to sort of seep through. And usually, you know, like the people who are in charge of who can tell the stories until the emergence of Nollywood and Bollywood and so on and so forth have been a very select group of people like a very, very, very select group of people. And they continue to be here in the West, in the place in which we need the most representation. Mm. They continue to be a very select group of people who get to decide which things go forward and which things do not, both in publishing <laughs> and in cinema or on TV. Victims or those that have sort of a trauma narrative of oppression, um, whether racialized or not, that goes along with their character's story today when we're looking at sort of mainstream TV, they're never allowed to be flawed. They're never allowed to be complicated, even like when their position is. And it kind of reminds me again of this, like this violence thing from, from the Boudicca story. We know that violence is traditionally the language, like the protest language of the politically disenfranchised. It's kind of, mm. there's a certain group of people, statistically speaking, and also sort of historically, who tend mm. to use violence as part of their protest and yet the flip side of that that we never seem to see because we're too busy doing good guys bad guys and the good guys have to be morally perfect is that mm -hmm. they're probably violent and responding to political oppression with violence because that's their only experience of politics of political authority like you mm -hmm. know we've got in this story we've got like the the violence of occupation the violence of colonial rule but then you've got violence of exploitation by the ruling elite you've got um, the violence of being separated from political power. You've got the violence mm. of not being able to control your own livelihood or being able to provide for your children. Like that control being taken away is an act of violence. And all yeah. of these acts of violence are committed by a political authority, you know, the, the yeah. state. And why yeah. shouldn't we respond with violence, you know? Why is that not considered normal for those who are oppressed to respond with violence? Why is violence now othered and considered you being morally bankrupt rather yeah. than well of course we're going to respond with violence no no it's because it's it's the same type of narrative that say that you cannot you shouldn't re respond fire with fire why like or you should rise above it why yeah who wins who wins that that's a narrative of power why are we always expected to be better than those who have the responsibility to protect us like they are responsible for governance whether that's by a democratic exactly. mandate or like mandate of, high, of, of, of heaven or mandate of superior firepower, whatever. They, why are we expected to be better than them? Why are we always expected to be? And like, there's, there's this whole narrative sort of in the, the academic literature on protest where it's like, um, you're looking at something as a case of rightful resistance. And you see it with Extinction Rebellion now, like they have a very good cause. They have, or Insulate Britain, sorry, or the uh, anti-oil protest that's going mm. on right now. Like you see that they have a really good mandate. They have a very specific policy target that would actually be really easy for the government to respond to. But because they're able to be characterized as bad protesters or illegitimate protesters, they can't move forward, you know, because violence or disruption isn't seen as valid. Helio and I ran out of time yesterday to do a proper conclusion, drawing all of our points together. It was an incredible chat. So much of it didn't make this video, but I'll be posting clips of it across TikTok, Twitter, and this YouTube channel over the next week. So stay tuned, follow across all channels. I'm going to put Helio's details here so that you can follow him for more incredible content. And I'm looking so forward to my next chat with Denise Headley, where we're going to be talking about The Children by Lucy Caldwell. It was another emotional ride. I am a bit nervous but it's going to be fantastic. So go follow Denise. She's over on Twitter and she's also on TikTok. And I'll see you then.